Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Elizabeth Nelson. I want to talk to you today about employment uh, and what caused me to write my book, The Healthy Office Revolution. When I was 23, I worked for the top advertising agency in the world. I worked with some of the biggest clients in sportswear, drinks, other consumer goods. I met professional athletes, celebrities, went on very exotic shoots. In a word, it was fabulous. I loved it. But like a lot of work these days, and especially working in the US, I started working evenings, I started working weekends, my head became foggy, it took me longer to do my tasks than it would have before I started working almost constantly. But it wasn't until I fell asleep during a bikini wax that I realized that I was sick and I was burning out. And when I left advertising, I knew that I didn't want that lifestyle anymore. I stayed in research, started looking into proactive healthcare, and what I realized in those years after was I didn't want it for anyone else either. So I started to put together a PhD that combined different faculties, very uh, alien faculties, the biomedical engineering department, the neurocognitive psychology department, and the business department to take a look at employee health. I also studied a very rare breed of humans these days, the Dutch. Uh, some of the, like the Finns, some of the happiest and healthiest people in the world. People who are reasonable with their work hours, uh, see their children before they go to bed at night, all that good stuff. And I put together a longitudinal study where, with the University of Twente in the Netherlands, we looked at uh, over 120 people over the course of seven months. We tracked about everything that we could about them. We looked at employee potential, productivity, all of that. And we studied about everything we can. We did interviews, uh, experiments, we had wearables on them, we did uh, daily ratings, and our daily ratings got up to 11,000 responses. Uh, and of course, our, our biological data was in the hundreds of thousands of data points, as it seems all studies need to have these days. But my theory and my strategy actually came from baseball. And it's not a popular sport to talk about around here, but I, I love baseball. And what's so interesting about it, even if it's not your sport, is that baseball actually changed the way that we strategize teams. There was a very poor team back in the day, not my team, the Oakland A's, that didn't have any money, that had a terrible team, but was doing the same strategy as everyone else. They spent 90 to 95% of their budget on three key players. A baseball team has 10 so 30% of their players. What's ironic is that businesses are doing the exact same thing right now. Businesses say that 30% of employees are fully engaged and working at their highest potential. So I said, what if we did the same thing that baseball did? Because they revolutionized the way that we looked at sports. They uh, took the other seven players, they statistically put together something that could win, and they started getting the wins. What if we did that in the workplace? I always like to leave that slide up for just a minute. Uh, one of the things that we, we looked at was nutrition in the office. Sugar uh, very much reacts in the same way as drugs in the brain. Your, your dopamine spikes, uh, your serotonin also raises and gives you that feel-good feeling along with the desire for more. And as you can see, it reacts uh, in almost exactly the same place in the brain. It's one of the reasons that doctors are suggesting that sugar be a controlled substance, just like alcohol or tobacco, and I would agree. So we started looking at how do we change sugar in the office, because like most offices, we have uh, treats, uh, black licorice or chocolate is the, the favorite, I think both here in Finland and in the Netherlands. 
I love it. But it really doesn't do us any good. So what do we do with that? So we put together a nutrition program, and we started looking at people to uh, see if we could change their behavior through no health education, actually. Because I can be very convincing, and I didn't want to study whether I can convince someone to eat healthier. We just wanted to change the environment. And it was incredibly successful. In an experiment that we did, uh, we did a task efficiency just to see how well they could do something uh, in accuracy. We saw a 45% difference in people that had eaten sugar 25 minutes ago versus people who had had a green smoothie. Now, if you think about that, and all these businesses uh, that are here today, they want to answer the fact, does healthy offices have a return on investment? And if you are thinking that your sugar-filled employees are doing one out of two things wrong, almost, and you think that's not a good investment, uh, I don't know what else to tell you. One of the other things that we talked about, or that we changed in the office, was plants, or biophilia which was a new concept for me, but basically the opposite of biophobia. The fact that we're all drawn to nature and we do better in them. And this has been an old concept in hospitals. This is something that has uh, worked very well. And it, the thing that's really exciting is it doesn't need to be a real plant. <laughs> ugly, ugly, ugly posters of plants in offices have shown to increase patients' ability to get better, their mood, their energy levels. It's absurd, but it works. This was the one I was excited about, and maybe being in the Nordics, it's also something that uh, you can relate to. Some of the best research on light and its effect on human beings is uh, coming from the Nordics, because you have the most extreme light. What offices, I was shocked to learn, are actually uh, completely uh, completely designed for pre-bed lighting. So something that's very good to have before you go to sleep. It's a yellow light usually, it's quite dim, uh, and it tells our brain, and it's above us, so it doesn't uh, hit the back of our eye where it needs to, or at least not entirely. So what we did was we changed it to a circadian-friendly lighting. In the morning, it was very uh, dim. In the afternoon, it got light and bright. and the afternoon, it got dim again because we also didn't want to put anyone into a mania, have them stay late at the office, turn them into me. We also worked with active workspaces. Uh, I don't know if any of you can walk on a treadmill and work at the same time. It was not something that I was very good at. But some of the active workspaces that we put into the office are uh, quite successful. It helps people with back pain. Uh, Activity is shown to increase attention and focus, inability control, it's an antidepressant, it's something that really needs to be put into all offices. The fact that we need to get up and move. They did a study on women that showed that women who were less likely to get up during the day actually had higher levels of depression, lower levels of serotonin, and uh, just were, were less motivated at work than women who got up and moved around during the day. And it makes sense. It's about blood flow. We need to move things around. Mindfulness is the, the topic of the moment, I think. And it's something that's very popular in the US. And unfortunately, has become something that's a bit of an all-in in terms of healthy offices. It's their one, one answer. And the problem with mindfulness being the solution is that teaching people to meditate uh, and keeping them in 80-hour work weeks, unable to see their family, eating bad food, is, in my mind, like meditating in a house on fire. It'll calm you down for a little bit, but it won't stop you from going up in flames. So I'm really challenging places that are just looking into meditation and mindfulness to say that this is an entire ecosystem. This is something that needs to be addressed as a whole, and we need to change the environment that we put people in, because we took them out of our, their natural habitat. Industrialization brought people into these concrete buildings with bad lighting and bad food and not walking around. We need to get back to something that makes sense naturally. And it's not, uh, it's not counterintuitive. We do want to be around plants. We do want to be around good lighting. We do want to eat good food that's good for us.
So I wrote a book about it, <laughs> which was incredibly scary in the moment, because I, I started off just talking about my science, and I had a fictional character uh, called April at the moment. And what I heard from people was that it needed to be a little bit more personal. I had gone through burnout. I had had a fabulous life in advertising, and I had done my own research. So I, I took this step, and I, I wrote it down in this book. It's being received very well, uh, and being called The Circle Meets Freakonomics. So very much easy to read facts and science about something that we can all really join in with. We've all worked at companies where it's been too much where we've pushed ourselves too hard, where the environment hasn't felt right, and we didn't know if it was us or what. Um, and also the, the, the science and the story of it to, uh, to get you through it. But I, I hope you have a wonderful time in the rest of the event, and uh, please check out the book. Thank you so much.